All right, well, welcome everybody. This is the eighth edition of Impact from Home brought to you by Net Impact Amsterdam. I'm gonna be your host today. My name is Kathy Serbara and I am uh, newly named Vice President of Net Impact Amsterdam. So super excited to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we're a member community of professionals who aim to contribute to a more sustainable society through our careers. And we're a free membership community. So uh, please, if you haven't already, join us. And uh, we'll have a lot more events coming up in the future. We will be taking a break over the month of August. But yeah, we will be back with a bang in September with a lot of new events. So looking forward to that. And super excited to have uh, Supraja and Christian here with us today. They come to us from a Fairware Foundation. And today we're going to talk about the sustainable garment industry, specifically from the context of uh, supply chains and the social sustainability, sustainability aspect of it. So I'm gonna give our guests a brief introduction and then we'll get started. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I have lots of questions lined up. I'm happy to say them all. I'm happy to say none of them if there's a lot of interest uh, coming from the audience. So Supraja is a sustainability professional with over 10 years of experience in the areas of sustainability management, capacity building, strategy development, and corporate social responsibility. She works at Fairware Foundation and is responsible for guidance to apparel brands on responsible purchasing practices and remediation, individually through liaising, as well as collectively in her learning coordinator role. So prior to moving to Europe in 2016, she has lived and worked entirely in the developing world, born and grew up in India, has lived and worked in Cambodia and managed assignments in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. She is passionate about women economic empowerment in the context of global supply chains. She's an engineer by education, super interesting, and having previously worked in gender focused organizations like Care International, uh, outside her work with supply chains, she continues to contribute to financial inclusion projects. Christian has been working in this space for over 10 years now. And uh, having started on the brand side, he spent the last few years working in the NGO sector. He grew up in West Africa and has lived all over the world. These exper experiences left a big mark on him in how he sees the world and in understanding how interconnected we all are in many ways. So that's a great introduction. Thank you both for being here with me today. Thanks for having us. Thank Hi, you. Jesse. Yeah. So um, when we have these kind of interviews, uh, people come from all sorts of different backgrounds in the sustainability community. So I like to start a bit general and then we can work our way to kind of more specifics. So I thought a great place to start is really for you to introduce to us what is Fairware Foundation and what makes it kind of stand out compared to other organizations that uh, work within the garment industry. And uh, I don't know who wants to start. If Supraja, you want to start, and Christian, maybe you can jump in. Yeah, sure. Uh, so maybe before I start, I can. I would also like to give a bit of a context so that uh, you know it uh, becomes the topic becomes more familiar and the purpose of an organization like Fairware is you know more clear. Uh, so when you look at the look at the garment industry, so it's an industry which has created millions of jobs you know globally. But at the same time, uh, what we see is that this is coming at a cost of, uh, you know, worker well-being and uh, whether they are being given the due rights or they have access to rights. Uh, and while in the context that, you know, the local governments where these factories are and factories themselves are responsible for ensuring this, in reality, this does not ha really happen. Uh, and then more and more what we are seeing is this is also very linked to how brands uh, businesses operate and how their purchasing practices are. And these have a direct impact on working conditions of workers. So that's where an organization like Fairware comes into, uh, you know, uh, it comes into the picture because uh, Fairware's vision is to ensure that workers, uh, garment workers have access to rights, uh, a dignified, uh, you know, employment and um, deserved pay. So that's what we are, uh, you know, the organization is focusing on and how we are addressing this is uh, by working 
through, you know, along with different stakeholders, be it brands, uh, be it factories uh, directly engaging with workers, but also trade unions, uh, other stakeholders in the region locally as well as, as well as internationally to see how we can achieve this change and how this industry can be, you know, uh, move to a new normal, as we call it. Uh, and uh, essentially, we are a not-for-profit foundation and our headquarters is based in Amsterdam. Uh, we are over 50 employees here and we have uh, local offices in uh, local teams in 11 production countries. Uh, Christine, if you want to add, if I missed out something in giving a very broad overview. No, I think that's a pretty good start. Yeah, that's great. So maybe a, a bit of a naive question, but how did we get here? Why are we at this point where we are now, where we need organizations like Fairware Foundation to look after the like, rights of these workers in the garment industry? Uh, should I go or Kristen, do you want to start? Oh, please, I'll, you go and then I can add some stuff on that. Um, so, I mean, if I were to just share a couple of points, you know, how, how the industry sort of looks like. So, first of all, if you say, okay, I, I buy a t-shirt, right? Uh, we, what we as consumers see is just the t-shirt. But what is important to know is probably that t-shirt has passed sort of 100 hands before it's even reached you. And in that sense, uh, what, what has happened is over the years, maybe from a point where, uh, you know, during some, maybe our grandparents' time or before that, we could buy clothes. We knew the sewer who was in the region. And, you know, we know as a consumer or as a business, everything was done locally or at some certain point, there was much more control. And then uh, there is sort of this whole, uh, you know, the legislative framework of, you know, all parts of the supply chain was in the same place. But now what we are looking at is, you know, the raw materials produced somewhere. Uh, you know, the stitching is happening somewhere, the processing is happening somewhere else, then the brand is played based somewhere else. So the supply chain is now spread out, you know, over the uh, globally. And the reason at some level for this has been, uh, you know, to access opportunities where the costs for making these products are lower. Uh, but what also it has led to is sort of a race to the bottom situation where you're saying, okay, I keep moving to different locations because it's cheap but then you're not looking at why it is cheaper and is it cheaper, but with certain conditions and certain ethical you know, systems and processes in place guaranteed, which is what, you know, what we are dealing with today. And which is why I think you know, there is this context of uh, you know, the situation. Uh, and that apart, I think more recently, the industrial, large industrial disasters which have happened like Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, for example, has sort of been a very big eye opener in that sense that, you know, okay, things are not going right. And we definitely need to look at how the business is structured and how it's more and more become, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you know, supply chain has become much more exploitative versus actually extending good or dignified job opportunities to, you know, these countries where it's needed. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good kind of way of, of setting it, and I and I believe that what we also have is a situation where um, if we think about the the rights that we have in I would say the in inverted commas that the West um, with regards to our working conditions, um, the 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 things that we've achieved over time, and the institutions that existed for that to take place, those same institutions are not do not exist or do not or aren't able to carry out their functions as they should. When we look at um, the roles that trade unions have played uh, across history in helping um, people like us have weekends, um, have a 40 hour, 36 hour work week, wherever it is, wherever you are. Um, we, we look at the roles they've played in ensuring safe and healthy working environments. But then we, we look in the, in the countries that we source from and see the, the, the roles of trade unions are really minimized and they do not have the ability to, um, to exercise the, the work that they need to do. The rights of the workers to, to, to join trade unions is also minimized and in some place completely obliterated. Um, and, and we have a situation now where brands are essentially also tasked with doing the work that local labor inspectorates are supposed to do because we have, you know, 
brands that aren't paying their taxes in the right way or they aren't supporting the economies in the right way. And so, um, and, and governments that are threatened by this idea that if you increase um, the, the implementation of existing laws, because they do have laws, um, if you actually implement those laws and you enforce those laws, then um, it will lead to conditions that causes companies to move and relocate their production into other countries. So you have this dynamic, um, which you could say is a, is a kind of um, result of the, the late stage capitalism that we're in, that creates this imbalance in, in power that then causes, um, means that brands are is in effect policing themselves in a situation where there should be independent or local enforcement of, or local policing of laws. So I think um, the, the roles and responsibilities are, are, are very twisted in the in the fashion industry and that, that is something that fairware is really looking to address yeah super interesting and, and i mean this is one of the reasons why i was really excited to have this q a because for me when i think about sustainable fashion like as the buzz term mm. it's easy for me to think about the environmental side of things so what is my piece of clothing made out of um you know when i wash it is it um, are there microplastics going into the water and into the ocean and, you know, that kind of way of looking at things, I think is um, maybe what I go to first. Maybe it's a bit of like the simpler way of looking at things and maybe, and I think I'm a bit overwhelmed when I turn more to like the social sustainability aspect of it. Um, I guess, is that what you're also seeing from a kind of brand perspective are people placing more um, work or responsibility on the environmental side of things because it's maybe a bit easier to deal with or wrap their head around or are you seeing more brands starting to look more deeply into the supply chain and the way that they treat their workers and this yeah. kind of social side of things um if i may Spraja, um mm -hmm. i think that um it, it's gone full circle because I think when, when we first, we, <laughs> I wasn't there at the beginning, but when it was first um, um, became an issue, we were really looking at um, sweatshop conditions in, mm -hmm. in factories. And that was really, you know, the, the reports that came out um, that, that caused this um, drive towards what can companies do to improve their supply chains. And as years went by, it became harder and harder to, um, to deal with those conditions. I mean, some of some things we moved away from, I think there are, there are way fewer companies now using sweatshops than there, than there were before, um, but they're not completely gone. And I think when we look at the places that Western HQ companies source versus the place that maybe local companies um, source, you will see a difference in this quality of factories. So, so really there's a, there's, there's a, there's a difference in, um, in the ability to to carry out to carry out work, um, I think um, the it's now easier to be able to say, well, microplastics are an issue, so therefore we can remove microplastics, or we can move the things that cause microplastics, and therefore you have a solution. Um, you can say, well, we want to source more organic cotton because there's a direct impact of organic cotton, and say, well, if we take if we source organic cotton, we're not using conventional cotton, which means that you have a much more quantitative <laughs> um, description of what was the problem and what is the result. When you're looking at social issues, there isn't really a direct correlation between one action and another action. You need a slew of different solutions um, with a slew of different partners to have an effective impact on the social issues in the supply chain um there's that plus what what this also kind of goes back to what i was just mentioning in the fact that the the way to really address these impacts is by giving power back to the workers and the factories and the people in the conditions to make decisions in a way that suits them um, and in order to do so they need to be able to um combined to form a collective, whether that's unionization, whether that's through worker representation, and that has to be effective. 
But it's also something that, again, looking at the brands that source there, the brands headquarters in, in Europe and America, um, are not in the, have not traditionally been supporters of unions. If we look at the way we treat trade unions in the West, the, the um, way we treat collectivization in the West, um, it's, it's, very, it's a very disconnected approach to what we are supposed to be doing in the factories. So I think um, it, it's a lot easier for, for people to say, let's solve the environmental issues and then the social issues we can kind of um, work on, but, but without really taking the steps necessary to get down into depth to solve these issues. Um, and then I would also like to say on top of that, that there can be no environmental justice without the ability to exercise your human rights. And so all the things that are happening um, from an environmental standpoint have an impact on people further down in the supply chain way more than they do on us. Um, but in order for those impacts to be minimized, that control and that um, um, the solutions need to be driven from the ground. And that can only happen at a systemic level if the workers and the factories and the owners are able to work together in order to improve their own situations and provide us with the feedback of how we can also change our behaviors um, as, as NGOs or as brands or as the organizations that, that, that are located in the West to then have long-term solutions to, to the problems. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and ahead, if I may add uh, to this, uh, I think one more aspect um, when we look at, you know, the difference between environment and the social, uh, you know, up, um, when you, the lenses, and why sometimes uh, brands immediately can pick up the environment versus the social ones is also, uh, like Christian mentioned, the quantitative and the qualitative nature. But it also reflects in terms of you know completing uh, your know your work on it. Uh, it's it's probably more tangible and uh, it's easy to verify to say an effluent treatment plant is in place and you know or you're using a certain kind of material so you know it's done. A lab can test it out for you and you can verify it. Whereas in the social, uh, when you're looking at social issues, they are much more uh, hidden. Many times they're hidden. Uh, you don't have as much control sitting in a different country with a different legislative framework. You, you have uh, minimal control. The amount of uh, time and energy required to invest in that is much higher. And in the end, uh, the, uh, you know how you need to verify, it's also not so black and white, like, okay, it's done, it's not done, but there are layers to it. and. And also it requires sort of an enabling environment is also an important factor to address some of these issues and where you're not the only player. So I think that's what, uh, you know, the social issues, why they are complex and why for, brand, for brands also it's more uh, difficult is, uh, you know, these, you know, multi, multi uh, different dimension <laughs> areas where you have sort of uh, limited control in some and more control in other and you have to work with so many different stakeholders. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I wonder, can you give us an example from Fairware of a brand that you've worked with or maybe a case study that you've successfully gone through where you can maybe give some examples of the various stakeholders that you've worked with within the supply chain and maybe it's still a work in progress, but at least to give us a bit of a sense of this complexity that you, that you talked about. Sure. I mean, in, in that sense, actually, just to maybe take a step back, like also understand how Fairway works with, you know, what we call a supply chain approach. Uh, it is essentially that um, the lens we use is looking at the entire supply chain and uh, we don't isolate different actors. So it's not like, okay, we tell brands you need to do this, but we emph emphasize on what we call a shared responsibility, because if you want conditions to change for a worker at a factory, of course, there is some effort the factory needs to put in, but it's also linked to how the brands engage with the factory, what kind of business relationship or how their purchasing practices are. So uh, what we focus on is a, a process-based step-by-step improvement approach. And in that sense, uh, we work with brands, uh, we work with factories, and we, we also directly engage with workers. And uh, this is uh, how we also have devised our verification tools so we have something what we call the brand performance check for a brand which we conduct annually. Uh, and what we look at there is um, we look at purchasing practices, we look at 
uh, you know, eff uh, efforts towards training and capacity building. We look at how you're monitoring your supply chain. How is your internal teams, you know, aligned with your efforts here? How is the CEO involved? Uh, how do you have budgets allocated and things like that? And then with factories, we do audits at factories. So we also verify how conditions are at present at the factory. We speak to workers through offsite worker interviews. We engage with local stakeholders to understand what is the situation in the region, what are the risks, and also the auditors will review those risks, risks in relation to the factory while conducting the audit. And thirdly, uh, we have a complaints helpline available at all the 11 production countries. So a worker can call on the helpline and inform any violation. And then Fairware would involve the brand and tell, inform them, hey, you know, we've received this and try to get a feedback from the brand from the factory and then, you know, go through an investigation process. So that's how we actually work with these different actors and, uh, you know, stakeholders involved at, at a process level. So of course, with each brand, this is what happens. So every year, each brand goes through an annual performance check. And then at the end of the check, the report is publicly available. So that's also uh, you know, good to know that um, the whole, the verification tool, uh, the performance check verification tool has an inherent advantage that it you know, leads to accountability and greater transparency in itself. Uh, so consumers or stakeholders can already look up at the report and see how the brand is performing, which are the weak points, what is the risk ex exposure. So even for investors, it's quite interesting to know what is the you know, risk exposure for this uh, particular brand from a social standpoint. Uh, so yeah, Christine, if you want to add anything on this. Um, I guess in, in terms of providing um, an, an example of how we work or, or things again, we're in a, was it last year, the year before, I really terrible with dates. Um, but um, the ILO ratified Convention 119, which is uh, a convention on violence and harassment in the workplace. And um, Fairware and their partners played a really big role in various countries on working on the local governments to, to also support this new convention. And so what we're able to do is we're able to act in, in various um, ways. So first of all, as a convener in pulling people together to understand the issues, putting together to, to, um, to have a direction to move forward, and then using that connection that we have between um, brands and suppliers um, to provide data that helps us in a, in a, it, to, to effectively lobby. So we, we have data-driven lobbying capacity that we use um, across the board. And so we're able to work with um, our partners, you, um, FNV and CNV, for example, in countries who are, who are union um, trade unions, um, international trade union bodies, um, to, to then influence stakeholders on the ground, um, whether it's be in Vietnam or Myanmar and other regions, towards um, convincing governments that this is actually the right thing to do. Um, and, and that we can, we can be successful in, because we have this connection between the brands, we're able to get visibility for our trade unions on what's going on in factories and get information, but also bring our brands on board so they understand what this means, why it's important, you know, why we need to have a new definition of, of violence harassment in terms of location, and then bring all the partners together to ensure that A, the vote takes place in the right way, and B, once the, the vote is, is, is taking place, we then have further work to do to ensure that ratification takes place in the countries as well. So um, while we can't say that it was because of us that Convention 190 was, was ratified, we do play a really important role in, in the countries in which we operate to ensure that everyone is moving towards the same, the same direction. Yeah, super interesting. It, so I'm hearing a lot about um, transparency and then also enforcement. So in some places there is legislation or laws that exist, but that simply in all like places, nothing is being there are legislation laws. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that nothing is happening to enforce them, um, yeah. or that there's no empowerment on the worker side of things to be able to stand up and say that this is, you know, our rights are, yeah. aren't being honored. So. I guess, what do you see as the, the most important step in the process then to like carry this forward? Is it that um, we need more transparency for brands to recognize that this is happening within their supply chain? Maybe they don't even realize it's happening or that there's 
something like locally that's empowering the workers and also ensuring that this legislation is being enacted in an appropriate way? A, a bit of all. <laughs> um, I guess maybe uh, what's what's the biggest hurdle at the moment? Um, I'm I, I, I'm really interested about the whole transparency question because I think a, mm -hmm. a, a lot of people talk about transparency without really understanding what transparency is for. Mm -hmm. So it's transparency for transparency's sake, and I and I think it's really important to know that many companies have had their factory information available online for a very long time, and I don't think that there's been a correlation to issues being solved. So when we look at transparency, we need to understand well, what is that transparency for? And the way that Fairware is working on transparency is with the idea that um, stakeholders, um, factories, workers can have access to information so they know which factories are um, that Fairware members are sourcing from and therefore can complain when, um, when when necessary, so workers can actually reach out and say, "Hey, I know that my where I work um, is, you know, being being run through a fairware that they their members of fairware. I have a complaint. They can put it through our complaint system, and we can address issues that way. But but when we look at the complaint system that fairware has, that for us is only the last resort. Mm -hmm. What we need to have our complaint system in the factories that are effective, and that then. Um, means that for us what what we really want to promote are, are are three key things the first is social dialogue making sure that um there's there's dialogue between workers and management in factories that um, allow for discussion and for problems to be addressed and solved at factory level because when you think about it we as as i say we brands have no business really going into a factory and then telling people what to do. The people in that situation should be able to address and solve issues as, as required. So that's a really big thing for us. Um, the second is when we look at gender, the fact that the industry is a, is a, is a I think it's 70, 80% women uh, in working in the industry. We have to ensure that um, the, the issue of gender inclusion um, goes across everything that we deal with. So when we're looking at social dialogue, uh, we look at the impact of um, that the trade unions can, can have in main to helping to facilitate social dialogue. We're also looking at what is the representation of women in those bodies? How many women actually are part of the work representative bodies? How many people, women are actually part of the trade unions? And then you can start having a much more impact because you're actually speaking from a position where women are included in the positions of power and, and influence in trying to solve issues as well. And then the third issue that Fairware has been focusing on and will continue to do so is, is living wages. With the idea that um, once you're able to um, earn a living wage, you're also in a much more powerful position to stand up for yourself because you're not constantly frightened about losing your job and, and how speaking out might actually affect you. You're in a better position to, to build more of a nest. So if you look at the impact of COVID in the fashion supply chain and how, um, use an example in India, when overnight they shut down facilities and they prevented people from, from moving between states, millions of people were stranded. And you had stories of, you know, women especially walking hundreds of miles back to their, their, their homes um, in order to, to, to find refuge because they could no longer afford to pay rent. They didn't have a buffer in terms of salary and were putting themselves in really precarious situations because of the lack of a living wage. So when we look at the, the issues that we're trying to solve, um, there are, we do work from a code of labor practices that cover eight key elements from the ILA convention. But for us, these three particular issues are when addressed immediately start to have an impact on all eight code of labor practice topics. Mm -hmm. So for us, the emphasis on, on these key, um, I would say all systemic, but also individual issues because you, you have the, the impacts of both systemic and individual level. And we place a lot of emphasis and resources on addressing those because we feel that that is where you're going to have more bang for your buck. Okay. Great. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions now in the chat box, so I'm going to move into there. Um, 
first one I see is Tatiana, she asked, how easy is it for brands to move production elsewhere if the cost of labor increases or measures to make production safer, et cetera? And do the workers have a choice at all or they have no choice but to accept any wage? Who wants uh, to take maybe I can that respond to that. <laughs> uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, a brand choosing to move locations, it's, you know, it's not just one factor, but a brand would consider multiple factors before choosing to move locations because it's also the type of product, uh, you know, where the technical expertise uh, is there and stuff like that. That's on the, you know, technical side. But on the other hand, when they are a member of Fairware, uh, they also have much more to look into when they move specifically if it's new countries, because then they need to do a complete due diligence to see like what is the risk level in the country and then uh, you know, they need to do an audit at the factory to ensure that the working conditions, at least the bare minimum is met to be able to work with that factory. So there is also a cost involved with all of that. But that apart, in general, we tell uh, brands that not to keep jumping factories, because what we believe as, you know, a basic foundation to also work on these kind of issues, be it living wage, gender or social dialogue, you need to have a strong relationship with the factory and the supplier. So for that, you need to one, have you know, more, much more years of relationship and have stable orders in the factory uh, so that the factory can actually you know, have a more stable work environment for the workers. Uh, so these are very critical points um, which we already, which members are also rated on in the brand performance check. So, um, so that you know, at least the foundation and these basic requirements are sort of met. And then I think you were asking about um, how it affects the workers and do wages, uh, you know, do they have a right on particular relating to wages? So in general, the bare minimum, which is expected is that the minimum wage needs to be paid. Like, like that's like a bare minimum. And uh, in case there are violations found on it, we consider them as extremely serious violations and which require like an immediate reaction and it, they, to, uh, they are required to be immediately addressed. And what we are looking for at, as, at a next level is uh, the point which Christian mentioned about, you know, freedom of association, collective bargaining. I, in an ideal situation, uh, the union should, uh, you know, understand what is the wage level needed for the factory and have the have a collective bargaining agreement in place which defines the wage level. So that's the ideal conditions where workers can represent themselves and define their own wages. But in reality, that does not happen in many situations, especially in factories where there are no trade union representation or they're not connected to trade unions. In such cases is where our, also our um, you know, approach to living wage comes in. Because at Fairware, we see the first step as what we expect from you is start increasing wage levels in your factory. Okay, if you don't achieve like the living wage estimate in the country, we understand that, but you need to keep moving. So every year we want to understand how you're working on increasing those wage levels. And an important component of that is worker involvement, where you engage like how, what is the process you have in the factory to engage workers and understand how these wages need to be increased and how also the payouts need to be made. So uh, I hope that responds uh, to that question pertaining to workers and wages. Um, and I think thirdly, uh, we have something called a responsible exit strategy. So, uh, which is also important because when you, when you as a brand exit a factory and let's say you're the only brand sourcing in the factory, it also means mm. that all those workers in the factory might lo will lose their jobs. So what we expect brands is also that when you're leaving a factory, you need to understand what is the impact of you leaving the factory. How have you engaged with the factory to give them prior uh, you know, information and notification so that they can find other you know, orders from other brands and ensure the, that these workers don't lose their jobs. And these are some of the evaluation criteria we also include in the performance check. Yep, fantastic. Uh, and then normally when one person asks a question, the questions <laughs> explode. So I will go back to the chat box. Um, an earlier question from Andrea, do you see countries competing for lower taxes, less employee collective building, minimal regulation, et cetera? And how can you demonstrate to governments that progress in these areas won't damage their economic development opportunities, such as Riss said the brands will move their factories elsewhere? Um. Yeah, so I think we we do definitely see that that competition happening between countries. Um, the 
the levels of um, taxes that you that the corporates have to pay or the deference of tax payments is quite often when we look at Ethiopia being used now as a as a, as a new location. Um, the reason why that's so attractive are the massive tax benefits that that um, have been negotiated by these companies or offered by the governments and taken advantage of by these companies. Um, and and you have to say that well the 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 governments are kind of kicking themselves because they are losing out on tax revenue that could also form the basis of social assistance should things arise because things arise. They're looking at, at um, losing out on tax revenue for, for supporting their local you know, um, populations in many other ways. So, so I think there's a little bit of a short-sighted nature there on um, for, for governments um, because of this fear that the companies will just move. Um, the, the last question was how you know, do companies simply move? Yeah, companies do move, but it's not that easy. To, to just get up and move to a factory in another place. I mean, the setup costs, as Supraja mentioned, are, are pretty high. The, there are quality issues that you have to go through. It's always guaranteed, and, and it's often safer to stay where you are and try to build that relationship and, and work than, than moving around every every season to try to find the next the next cheaper deal. So there is definitely a, um, a, a component of, of the fear of governments um, that, that, that causes restrictions on freedom of associates, that causes these things to happen. Um, when you, you look at the, the impact that it has, um, that, that functional trade unions have within the industry, you can start to actually um, talk to governments about the benefits of that. Because um, where there are trade unions, where there's collective bargaining, they um, sort out stuff better, <laughs> issues better within their organizations. Um, they have better performance in terms of quality. They have um, lower um, turnover rates. Um, they're more efficient. And you could, um, I mean, it's hard to say exactly how, what the percentage difference is, but you could actually argue that the, the more stable a f facility is, the um, better the value that you get from that factory rather than one where you're constantly churning out orders. So um, the, the, this notion that simply um, being an, a government where you, um, you, you implement and you actually follow up legislation will lead to people leaving their droves is not necessarily true. And I think it's up to us to um, speak to every government so that each government can understand that and hopefully universally say, okay, we, we now have to start doing things that, that make sense for the people who work, who, who work in the industry, um, because it's, it's just not just that um, the brands are allowed to take advantage in, in, in quite a, a, a disturbing way. And they, as the government are left in the position where they have no money in their, in their coffers to actually support workers, if the brands do move, there needs to be much more of an understanding about the the, the relationship between the two the two entities. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. And actually, that reminds me. Recently, Surprise, you posted an article on LinkedIn about kind of dark factories in the UK, and how you know there are so many clothing factories once based out of the UK that then moved, but now these dark factories have popped up where they've gone under the radar of the government and of labor laws to still produce, or they're very small factories um, and in, indeed to kind of keep up with demand at a more kind of local level. And so are you seeing this is, was this an article that you just came across, but is this something kind of more systemic that if these factories are moving around, then these kind of buildings that used to be used for factories are turned into kind of like underground factories to still supply uh, supply the demand in, in a different way, kind of under the radar? So for me, I think uh, what actually uh, sort of interested me in that article was more around, um, you know, this notion that, okay, there are these countries with, you know, especially in the EU, you would expect certain conditions, certain standards. Uh, but, you know, when you look at unknown factories or unauthorized subcontracting, so the, it seems that this is happening even in these locations and uh, you know that's what you know uh, you know was much more visible to me in, in that article that 
and why it was happening. It was also the inherent nature of why things were suddenly being made in these kind of places that you're saying you want to actually, okay, some influencer on Instagram posts a dress and you want that dress to be coming to the market like in, in a week. Uh, then of course you can't produce somewhere else and get it into the UK. Uh, but then you're then looking for these suppliers who can make this overnight at a, at a price which seems to be untrue, uh, to actually be possible with all these uh, you know, good working conditions guaranteed. So then it also raises the questions that where, where is this being made? And uh, in that sense, I think uh, uh, Christian has been working uh, on, on Italy as well, the risk assessment which uh, Fairware did. So maybe Christian, you can share on, on that and also the situation in uh, you know, dark factories in UK. Yeah, um, before I get to that, I'm gonna be a little bit controversial. Um, and first of all, say that the, the issues that took place in Leicester have been going on for years. I worked as CSR, as a CSR manager in the UK over 10 years ago. And um, there were issues in Leicester then. So for people to claim, for certain companies to claim that they didn't know what was going on in Leicester is absolutely completely wrong. Um, the um, People have known about issues in Leicester for a while. And I would even go as far to, as to say that there is actually a, a racism element linked to what's happening there. Because when you look at the people working in the Leicester factories, there are usually people of South um, South Asian descent, um, migrant workers, some of them illegal, who have been locked away, and um, the government have turned deliberately a blind eye because a of the the, the types of migrants, and b the types of people that are running those facilities who are also of of that origin. Um, as the UK government are very um, concerned about being called racist or of racial being accused of racial profiling. So I think there's an other element of that, which I think is also pervasive within the fashion industry, which we don't have to get into now, which is also kind of leftover colonialism and, and racial elements of the industry, which we have not really dealt with and addressed. So there's that. Um, now back to Supraj's point, which is, um, yeah, we expect European um, governments, European um, industries to be better monitored, to have functional labor protectorates to have the laws in place that allow for um, the workers to be able to implement, um, exercise their rights. But when you look into certain supply chains um, and looking into the way that um, the, the Italian supply chain is run, for example, there are gaps in that system. And I think very often we, we, we do turn around and, and as a European, as a European African, we, we tend to turn around abroad and say, well, look at the problems abroad and, and what the issues are when there are issues right under our noses. And so I think it's also important that as we try to address issues in Asia, in, in, you know, in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, in Cambodia, that we do not turn a blind eye to the very same issues that occur under our noses in places where we should be expecting a lot more. Um, there are issues related to wages in, in Italy. There are issues related to the, the types of contracts that workers have. There are issues related to subcontracting that, that need to be dealt with. And, and these are, you know, just an hour's flight from, from many of us that, in which they're taking place. So these dark factories do exist. They, they exist as a, as a response to, again, the, 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 the speed of turnover that that the fashion industry has now got itself into that it can't quite escape because it promises so much for so little in terms of payment. And then you have essentially made a deal with the devil and you have to get the, the goods wherever you can. Um, so, so one of the things that we do as Fairware is we're also trying to understand what is your business model? What is it based on? Because your business model is also, um, a factor that has a very big impact on the supply chain. And if you do not accept that, and if you can't adjust your purchasing practices, then you also cannot address the issues that you find in your supply chain. Yeah, super interesting. And I, I think this, it ties into Laura's question. She had asked about to what extent the fast, fast fashion business model can be reconciled with appropriate environmental and social practices. It sounds like it's near impossible <laughs> to, for fast fashion to continue to exist and be environmentally and socially sustainable. 
And does this maybe then point to something that we need to do on the consumer level for us as consumers to not expect that when we see someone on Instagram with an outfit that we really like that the next day we can have it kind of in our mailbox? Um, is it something that we as consumers need to think differently about? Sure. Uh, I think from um, my experience of especially working with fashion brands, uh, not really fast fashion brands, but even in the fashion uh, industry space, right? Uh, what you're looking at is, um, you know, turnaround times is important because then you're looking at a particular season, you're looking at a particular, you know, uh, uh, design, which may or may not, uh, it, it has a smaller window when compared to, you know, other kinds of, uh, you know, spaces within the government sector. So in, in that sense, I think what we, when we work with members, what we look at is we, we try to understand from them, how have they integrated this when they look at the supply chain and when they look at what their sales teams want, are these aligning and can they match uh, while ensuring that no excessive overtime happens or, you know, um, taking into account how, how much time the fabrics will take to reach, what kind of additional processes are required on that, you know, garment before it can, you know, come, uh, come back or, you know, put in the stores. So those are the kind of things which brands need to already think. Uh, and I think uh, in my experience, when we look at overtime issues, what, what some brands have started looking at is when they speak to their design teams, they already, uh, you know, review and say, okay, if this cut or this additional, you know, embroidery or beadwork, what is the additional time it might take? So, and is that okay for the final product? Uh, and if not, then we need to cut out on one of these elements if we really want to, you know, uphold all these uh, kind of situ uh, conditions which we have committed to as being a member of Pever. So I think that's the kind of mindset which brands need to start. And consumers with consumers, yeah, it is extremely important because at some level, some of these industries are also driven by consumer demands. So I think it's very important that consumers understand what goes behind, uh, you know, something which is cheap and fast. And uh, it's all about voting with your money. So end of the day, if you're going to start putting money into brands, knowing that, you know, it's unrealistic that you can get something at this price. Uh, I think that's a conscious choice which you're making. And it's important that consumers uh, become aware and also start, you um, in terms of also for brands, it's important to start sharing that, you know, uh, what, what are the issues they face and what it means. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. And to, to add to that, I think um, it's the way that fashion seems to be trying to um, reconcile this notion of environmental sustainability and speed seems to be the focus on circularity that's mm. that's that's a massive um project that's being undertaken by the fashion industry right now it's like can we um be circular and also maintain our business models um and uh, and i think that that is also a little bit short-sighted because um what we do need to look at is the consumption the volumes of consumption that we do and so it, it's not just about training out you know the same amount of clothes, but making sure they're recyclable. It's actually about producing fewer clothes and ensure that um, people may be and, and change of behaviors. So uh, um, looking at things like rent the wardrobe, um, would that be a, a, a decent way to go? Because I mean, um, when, you, when you look at the amount of clothing that people have and then the, the amount that is left in their closets, either worn once or never worn, um, it's, it's, it's incredible that there's a lot of waste. Um, what, what I also think, and this is probably where, where Supraj and I uh, differ a little bit is, is a lot of this is caused by the brands. Um, I, I think br brands have this, this way of saying, well, we do what the consumer wants. Um, and yet they will also tell you that consumers don't know what they want. And so you, you can't have, you can't have it both ways. And if you think about who has the, the power to weaponize these, these things, it's the brands. It's the brands that create the demand and it's the brands that create the need that they have to then fulfill that demand. So if the brands turn around and say circular is sexy, um, sustainable um, sourcing is sexy, um, paying the right amount of money um, so that you can um, pay your workers right is sexy, 
I'm pretty sure that in a very short period of time, you will actually find um, uh, uh, a consumer profile change in order to match that because they do have, they know more than us than we do, you know, <laughs> about, about us, you know. So, so if they really want these things to change, they could in a second switch that. But, but they're also part of a bigger economic system that, that they have to fill, the, the quarterly profits, the shareholder value question, all of those things feed into the way that we, the, the way the fashion industry is run now. And while we try to address these issues that are very particularly unique to fashion, I think that there's a much wider systemic question that we need to address, which is what is this system for if it's not the rapacious um, kind of um, uh, use of goods and materials and, and the taking advantage of workers what is the system for and then how do you create an economic system that actually rewards better behavior and, and, and promotes better behavior rather than what we do now, which we all know. I'm guessing that most of the people sitting here on this call and most of the people in our, in, our, in our bubbles are all aware of that. And we're looking for those solutions that we can then take to our, to our companies, to our friends, to our families. It's actually, there is a better way of doing it. Yeah. yeah, and I think uh, just maybe to clarify what I was trying to say, I am in very much in alignment with you, uh, Christian. I was what I was saying was more in terms of when you have responsible, sustainable brands operating in the same environment as others who do nothing, and uh, you know, in that situation, I feel yeah. it's consumers who can actually you know consciously choose to uh, vote with their dollars for brands who are actually doing better, uh, such that you know they are not to actually create that level playing field which is needed yeah but i completely agree with uh, christian especially when it comes to the power of which brands have uh, they are sometimes even more powerful than local governments if you take at some when you look at small countries some of these brands have so much power that they can even dictate to a government to change laws if, if it comes to yeah. that and we have many examples globally around that so there's no doubt that these many of these brands have that power and it's exactly the question as to why they're not using it to do better. Yeah. And then just one more thing, Kathy, just speaking of, Please, of yeah. laws and legislation, there's also, mm -hmm. I think, um, something happened at European level, which I think is going to have a, a massive impact on, on industry as a whole, which is the push towards mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. Um, and um, while that also means that it will be compulsory for every company in every sector to have some level of human rights due diligence. What is also being looked at as well is ways that you can then reward companies that are doing better, mm. whether that's through um, lower VAT, um, better, better kind of um, tax allowances, and better rates of, um, of loans, all these different type of things are being looked at. So, so it is something that's being looked at seriously and, and we are trying to find solutions, um, mm -hmm. not just at industry level, but at, at the fashion industry level, but also at a European wide um, legislative level. Yep. Super interesting. And, and realizing that we're almost at one o'clock, so I do want to wrap things up. Um, maybe as just a final question, and I have a feeling that I know what the answer to this will be for both of you, but um, let's say 10 years down the line, what's one thing that you would like to see happen based on all these things that we spoke about that, um, you know, what, let's say a dream of yours for 2030 uh, in the garment industry? Ladies first, Raja. Sure, I can go for it. Uh, I think I would say that maybe there, uh, the dream would be that there's no need for organizations maybe like us, that the industry is working well and workers have their rights. So uh, not needing, you know, any of these, um, you know, discussions or, uh, you know, checks and all of that and mm -hmm. having an ideal situation where you know, the industry is clean, it's providing good employment, safe, uh, good working conditions. And then it's, it's a level playing field with sort of shared, shared responsibilities and shared interests as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I have to say that I, I also agree with that. I think the, the, the fact that organization like ours exists is, is a problem and that, that we need to address um, the, the many issues that go with it and i and i think that 
when we when we look at the fashion industry i think it's such a microcosm of so many other industry um issues that are, that exist um in in our system um, whether that's the financial system whether that's um in environmental whether that's social or even um racial colonialism all these different types of things i think you can see very clearly in the fashion industry and and i guess that um as, as I agree with that end goal, what I want to see as we, as we move towards that end goal is open conversations about how we got here and acknowledgement of the mistakes that have been made, whether it's by governments and brands and, and whoever else is involved um, and, and, the, and, the, and the use of that, that acknowledgement to then create the system and the conversations that gets us to a place where we can have that, um, that, that, that better vision of the world. So, so that's my wish for how we get there. But, but yeah, we share the same, the same desire. Amazing. Thank you both so much. And um, please, everyone, check out Fairware Foundation to learn more about what they do. And I think my biggest takeaway from this discussion, indeed, is to have more conversations about um, you know, the source of the things that we use every day and the companies that we purchase from and um, yeah, see if we can demand better and uh, support foundations like Fairware and what they do. So thank you both Supraja and Christian. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll see you back in September for the next episode of Impact From Home. So thank, thank you, you both. very much for having us. Thank thanks, you. Thanks yeah. and thanks everyone for also the very in interesting questions. Thank you. Yeah, great. Bye. 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 Bye.